first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And I know that a lot of us have been to the Wildlife Center or we want to go to the Wildlife Center. We're in one of those situations. And I especially want to thank Joe for being a really wonderful speaker. Joe Marcus is the Native Plant of North America Program Coordinator at Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center and holds a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture from the University of Georgia in Athens. He's developed and maintained the system for management of plant accession records and garden mapping at the Wildlife Center and manages the plant answer services. With a lifelong love of learning and a fascination with nature, Joe studied horticulture under such legends as Michael Deere and Alan Armitage. After working in the wholesale nursery business for a number of years, Joe found his true calling when he arrived at the Wildlife Center in 2000. He has been closely involved with the organization for many years and will shed light on the path the center has taken and the impact it has had on various fields. Joe is the coordinator for the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center for the Native Plants of North America, which is a web resource providing information for all 25,000 plus vascular plant taxa native to the US and Canada. He has served in that capacity for more than 10 years and has worked on the program for nearly 20. In 2018, he updated the Campbell and Lynn Low Miller's Texas Wildflowers, a field guide. So, Joe, over to you. Good evening, friends. Before I start, I'd like to thank you, the Clear Lake Chapter of the Native Plant Society, for spending some of your time with me tonight. I especially appreciate Bev Morrison for inviting me to speak to you and for helping me through the process of visiting with you. I am not a tribe of the hike. I actually predate the folks who live in caves. So it might seem odd that I work in a technical field. It is. With that said, I'm grateful to Debbie Bush for her kind assistance and patience in walking me through the technical details of bringing this presentation to you. Thank you, Bev and Debbie. My special cause, the one that alerts my interest and quickens the pace of my life, is to preserve the wildflowers and native plants that define the regions of our land, to encourage and promote their use in appropriate areas, and thus pass on to generations in waiting the quiet joys and satisfaction I have known since my childhood. My name is Joe Marcus. I'm with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, not wildlife, it's Wildflower Center. Though the major focus of my work is technical, databases and websites, I consider the essence of my work to be customer service. Often when I answer the phone or respond to an email, the caller or writer is surprised, shocked even, to find that they have gotten through to a real life person. I have been taking such calls and emails for more than 20 years, and it seems that the personal touch grows ever more difficult to find in our world. Yes, yet I believe that now more than ever, personal touch is essential in our lives. It is my sincere desire to give every patron of the Wildfire Center, no matter what their reason for coming or for contacting us, the best service, the best experience possible. I addressed all of you as friends tonight because I hope that you will consider me and my colleagues at the center your friends too. The heart of this presentation is what was in Mrs. Johnson's heart, her dream, her vision, and the ongoing realization of that vision. I can say a lot about Mrs. Johnson and her vision, and I will, but I'll also let her speak in her own words. The environment is where we all meet where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing all of us share. It is not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens on what we can become. For the past 10 years or so, I have been the Napona coordinator at the Wildfire Center. What? I think I just heard someone ask, what the heck is a Napona? Why, thank you, random audience member, for your totally unexpected, but nevertheless timely question. NAPONA is an acronym we use internally for the native plants of North America. It is the Wildflower Center's online plant information resource. If I accidentally use that acronym again during the remainder of this presentation, I apologize in advance. 
When Bev asked, and I agreed to give this talk to you tonight, it was my intent to unveil to you the new Native Plants of North America website. Unfortunately, that was not to be. But I will let you know more about that just a bit later. In most talks I do like this one, I ask, do you know who Lady Bird Johnson was? I can hear you chuckling all the way from Clear Lake. For all of you, I'm sure that does seem like a ludicrous question, but I assure you that many young people I speak to today have no idea who she was. For many reasons, that's too bad since she achieved so much in her life and continues to give so much to us some 17 years after her passing through her words and through the fruits of her vision. In 1982, Mrs. Johnson, along with her dear friend, the Hollywood actress, Helen Hayes, celebrated Mrs. J's 70th birthday by co-founding the National Wildflower Research Center. It was not a spur-of-the-moment spur act. In fact, the founding of the institution that lives on today as the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center was only one step, granted a giant step, in the realization of a vision that was birthed in her mind and in her heart years before. But why did she ask Ms. Hayes to co-found with her? Mrs. J did not believe her own name carried enough gravitas. I trust that most, if not all of you, before today have heard of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. I trust, too, that many of you have visited our gardens. For those of you who have not visited us yet, this is a photo from our botanical garden in springtime. It is without a doubt a physical manifestation of Mrs. Johnson's vision. But our online resource, The Native Plants of North America, is every bit a realization of her vision also. I define vision as the ability to imagine that which has never been seen. You might have noticed that I've now referenced vision several times. You will hear me mention vision, mention it some more during this presentation. On a personal note, I want to take a moment to say that a vision unrealized is no more than a dream. I have a few of those myself. If you have a vision, I would encourage you to be bold. Make it a reality. Mrs. Johnson showed us that visions realized can do great things. My heart found its home long ago in the beauty, mystery, order, and disorder of the flowering earth. During the development of our garden, before a single stone had been turned, before any wildflower had been planted, in one of dozens of planning meetings, the landscape architect on the project asked, Mrs. Johnson, what do you want this garden to look like? Mrs. J thought about his question for a moment and then answered, I'd like for it to look like God set it down there. She set a pretty high bar for the landscape point. But the quote you see on this slide, I think, captures very eloquently exactly that sentiment. How about the native plants of North America? I hope that most of you have visited it and perhaps make regular use of it. If you have visited the center and enjoyed your visit or have visited the native plants of North America and found it useful, Please say a silent prayer, a silent thank you to Mrs. Johnson for her vision. My hope for what lies ahead in the field of landscape design, our own and that of the professional, isn't a revolution against the use of non-native, but a resolution to educate ourselves about what has worked for Mother Nature through the ebb and flow of time, and to put that knowledge to work in the planned landscapes that are everywhere a part of our lives. The fact is, if you pay much attention at all to native plants, and clearly you do being NIPSOT members, that awareness is very likely, at least in part, attributable to Mrs. J's vision of studying wildflowers and her advocacy not only for their protection, but for their place in our landscapes. For me, wildflowers are joy giving. They have enriched my life and fed my soul and given beautiful memories to sustain me. Beyond their aesthetic value, there are other valid reasons for their increased use. As we experience problems with lowering water tables and increasing maintenance costs, 
Incorporating nature's bounty into our landscapes may provide a viable alternative in suitable areas to our concept of manicured clipped grass. Soon after the creation of the National Wildfire Research Center, Mrs. Johnson made some land and some other resources available for her nascent institution, where a few scientists and a swelling cadre of volunteers conducted various horticultural experiments with native wildflowers. At the same time, another group of volunteers and one staff person began building a library of books, a photo library of 35 millimeter slides, and amassing an amazing collection of information about North America's native plants. That collection of documents from thousands of sources and organized in many large file cabinets came to be known as the Clearinghouse. We use the clearinghouse to provide information about native plants to our own researchers, researchers elsewhere, and to others with interest in wildflowers and other native plants all over North America and beyond. In 1995, the institution uprooted and moved to its current location in South Austin. Very soon after, the board of directors changed our name, against Mrs. J's wishes, I might add, to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. In 2001, botanist Damon Wade joined their team. Damon already had experience building databases and websites, and he soon had his own vision for an electronic version of the clearinghouse. He and webmaster Philip Hawkins created out of whole cloth the resource Damon named the Native Plant Information Network, or as we referred to it in those days, NIPN. With only a few thousand species treated, along with about 12,000 images initially, it was introduced to the world on October 1st, 2003, almost exactly 20 years ago. Where flowers bloom, so does hope. Inside each of those seed heads lies much hope for the future. So what's the point of natives at all? Why natives? Why would we, why should we garden with native plants? Again, Mrs. J had some things to say about that. Wherever I go in America, I like it when the land speaks its own language in its own regional accent. Why garden with native plants? Because Mrs. Johnson said so. That's a good enough reason for me. Of Mrs. J's quotes, this is my favorite. But it's not her only one on the subject. By the way, anyone who ever heard Mrs. J speak knows that she spoke in her own regional accent. I think these quotes get to the heart of her vision. Native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. Mrs. J had a good point. A reason to go with natives? Because you're a Texan. Or I would venture to say most of you are Texan. I, for example, am originally from North Georgia, and I appreciate the fact that though I've lived in Texas for the past 44 years, I'm not a native Texan. In fact, where I'm from, we call those who were uninvited and came to stay as long as I've stayed in Texas, carpetbaggers. I must say that Texans have been much more welcoming to me than that. I want us to know our world. If I lived in North Georgia, on up through the Appalachian, I would be just as crazy about the mountain laurel as I am about blue bonnet. Whatever your place of birth, if you were here now, I'm sure you want to be as Texan as possible. I suppose if your heart desired, you could make your little acre of heaven look like, oh, let's say, Vermont, California, New York, France, China, or God forbid, North Georgia. Or you could look around you and find that there are hidden gems for your garden right here in Texas, right in the Clear Lake region. That was the case Mrs. J was making. By the way, the mountain laurel Mrs. Johnson mentioned in her quote is not our beloved Texas mountain laurel, the forest of Pindaflora, but a completely unrelated species that was dear to my own childhood. This is mountain laurel, Calme latifolia, an Appalachian species. So, what are native plants of North America? This is the current homepage of our plant information resource. Since 2020, uh, actually the end of 2020, our database has contained records for all 
from the approximately 25,200 species, subspecies of botanical varieties native to the United States and Canada. As you will see, this resource contains many tools to help you, whether you are a botanist, a nursery professional, a native plant enthusiast, or a gardener. There is not enough time allotted in this presentation to show you all of the features of the site, but I will touch on highlights for those who are unfamiliar with it. This page, like most on our site, is too large to display on one screen, but scrolling down the page, we come to a sample of a few of the most used collections. This section of the page provides portals to just a few of the hundreds of special collections of native plants on our site. site. Special collections are sort of lists on steroids with a link to all the information on our site about the species in each collection. Farther down the page are links to the three major resources in our database, the National Suppliers Directory, the National Organizations Directory, and the Image Gallery. The first two resources are really misnamed since they are more international than national and cover all of the United States and Canada. The suppliers directory lists nurseries, seed companies, landscape professionals, and consultants who specialize in native plants. The organization's directory lists private and public institutions that have an ecological footprint. The Clear Lake chapter of NIPSOC, for example, would qualify for inclusion in the national organization's directory, as is the state and some local chapters of NIPSOC. I will delve farther into the image gallery shortly. The resource that is consistently one of the most frequently visited part of our website is Ask Mr. Smarty Plant. Smarty, as we like to refer to him, provides answers to more than 10,000 questions we were asked through our website about native plants and native plant gardening. While we are not currently adding questions and answers to the resource, we do intend to bring Mr. Plant back from vacation sometime in the future. But let's suppose you're simply looking for some information about a specific plant. Then the native plant database species page is your resource, and it's where you'll land if you do a search for an individual species on our homepage. This is the native plant database species page for prairie gay feather. Rather, it's the top of that species page. We provide taxonomy information here, both scientific and common names. We also include the description of species, and some general comments about it. Scrolling down the page, we find a link to the image gallery, along with some sample thumbnail images. There are extensive lists of plant characteristics and description of flowers and flowering period, as well as distribution information. Below this is much more information, but for the sake of time, I'll let you explore these sections on your own. The image gallery always runs neck and neck with the native plant database, for the most visited part of our website. It currently features nearly 83,000 images of North American native plants, and I have at least that many more in the queue awaiting publication. A few of the images that have been published are featured in this presentation. You might have noticed several excellent photos shared with us by your own chapter's Carolyn Fanning. Carolyn is a longtime contributor to this image gallery and I'm thankful for her willingness to share her work with us. And here is an image page for one of the photos in the gallery. In addition to containing a large version of the photo, the page also provides information about who took the picture, Carolyn in this case, when and where it was taken, and other data. Like the species page, there is more to this page than can be shown in a single slide. In fact, I had to zoom out considerably on these pages to show more of the information on them. On my computer and undoubtedly yours, the images will be much larger. As I mentioned earlier, it was my intention to introduce tonight a brand new version of the native plants of North America. Sadly, I cannot. Our web developers found the project to be much larger task than they had anticipated, and the new site remains in development. We do not yet have a date for the site to go live, but we expect that it will happen sometime this fall. By the way, I did not choose Carolyn's photo of poison ivy as a metaphorical message to our web developers. They are actually really great guys. Rather, it was intended as an apt illustration of autumn, the season that I hope our new site becomes a reality. But I do want to at least give you a sneak peek 
or what our new splash page will look like. Outside of some wildfire center staff and a few select others, you are among the first to see this page. I am truly sorry that I cannot show you more tonight. Truly sorry. This new resource has been anticipated for more than a decade and has been several years in planning and development, even before the web team started their work. In truth, this upgrade is only phase one of a planned multi-phase project to move the resource far beyond its current state. So what will this upgrade do? Several years ago, we received a substantial financial contribution from a very kind donor in West Texas. The donation was specifically earmarked for improvements to navigation, usability, and enriching the user experience. That is our current goal. But a new website is not all that's new at the center. Last year, we created a new team at the Wildfire Center, Science and Conservation. The pendulum that swung away from our institution's early focus and Mrs. Johnson's vision for the National Wildfire Research Center is swinging back towards scientific investigation. Under the leadership of Sean Griffin at the center and Shalini Jha, our scientific advisor and academic director of research at the University of Texas, we are embarking on a host of new scientific initiatives. Sean is an entomologist who studies bee plant interactions and their ecological implications. He and the team he has put together continue to do that work. And we continue our landscape restorations research, now 24 years running, in which we study the long-term effects of various burning and mowing management regimes on natural landscapes, from roots to shoots and the fauna that depend on plants, we have studies utilizing our research. But we have also joined two major international studies investigating the effects of soil disturbance and drought on ecosystems. We are also hosting and advising numerous graduate and postgraduate studies. Our scientific research programs are just beginning. Most recently, botanist Dr. Jonathan Flickinger joined us to head up our revived conservation program. He will be working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Center for Plant Conservation, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the National Park Service, as well as other botanical gardens to study and conserve our most imperiled plant species. Additionally, Jonathan will oversee our herbarium and seed bank. If that was not enough, he will also manage our garden's living plant collection records. That particular task was one that was assigned to me for more than 22 years. I am pleased to place that important responsibility in his very capable hands as I near retirement. The Clear Lake region is blessed with among the highest average rainfall totals in the state. I emphasize average rainfall totals in years like this one in 2011, even Clear Lake and Houston suffered from drought, as you well know. Those drought years are likely to occur with greater frequency going forward. The landscapes of folks like you, who already use native, will always be much better positioned to survive and even thrive in those difficult times. The environment is where we all meet, where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing all of us share. It is not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens on what we can become. I appreciate you allowing me to come into your lives for a little while tonight. Thank you. Question? We have appreciation comments, and one of them is to Carolyn for being a primo photographer. And we certainly are glad that you selected a lot of her photos for us to be able to enjoy. What is the most common questions you field? Ooh, let's see. Uh, in my office, by email and by phone calls, I probably get more questions about turf than anything else. Uh, turf questions, turf issues. A lot of people are looking to stop using, especially St. Augustine, but also Bermuda. Uh, want to switch over to native grasses and want to know, you know, all they can find out about it. In the last couple of years, I've continually received a lot of questions about uh, milkweeds. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are wanting to help the monarch butterflies. And so a lot of people are planting milkweeds and wanting to do all they can to help them. And while I encourage that and, and we do everything we can to assist them with that, we always make sure to 
remind them that adult female monarch butterflies lay eggs on milkweed, but adult male butterflies don't lay eggs and they they need nectar. All of them need nectar. So don't forget your nectar plant. Uh, that's really important for all butterflies, monarchs included. Can you tell us about visiting the center? Like how much time do you think it would take to really enjoy and partake of what's there? Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't recommend visiting right now. <laughs> it's terribly hot here. And you can't get here early enough to, to enjoy it like you can in different seasons, but fall and especially spring. April is the uh, peak of the season for us. About the first week of April is the peak of the blue bonnet season. And many of the other wildflowers are flowering then. I like March and I like the month of April. I also like October here. It's especially nice with the uh, fall colors with a lot of the actress flowering then and um, Maximilian sunflowers and other things. So fall seems to be purple and yellow and <laughs> spring seems to be more white and red and blue. So that's just the general trend. Uh, I would like to say, you know, spend as much time as you can. Take your time. And while you're here, take the time to just sit and be quiet and listen. Listen to our birds. Listen to the children that are in the garden. Listen to the wind and the trees. Um, listen to the water at our hill country stream or out in our family garden. Just, just be, just be. And um, I think that's what Mrs. J appreciated. By the way, invariably, wherever you go, people will refer to Mrs. Johnson as Lady Bird. And that was her name. But none of us who knew her would bang to refer to her as Lady Bird. It just seemed too familiar. And we all referred to her as Mrs. J, and she appreciated that. Not suggesting that you do that, but uh, that was just the thing that we did. And I was fortunate to have been around long enough that I got to know her. Personally, I can't can't say that I was one of her best friends, but I did get to know her, and and that was a, a blessing for me. What is the biggest change you have seen during your time there? We've added some major gardens, one of which I was very involved in. We added the Texas Arboretum, which is the um, state arboretum of Texas. Uh, we are the state botanical garden of Texas, and uh, the arboretum being a a botanical garden for trees. So it's dedicated strictly to trees. We have a wonderful display there of the progeny of famous and historic Texas trees. It's a circle of live oaks. They're all live oaks. There are other historic trees that are not live oaks, but we chose these. I think there's uh, 22 on the circle and, and, um, eventually there'll be majestic oak. Uh, and they're growing actually pretty rapidly now. So they've come right along. And then a couple of years after the uh, family garden opened, we opened or the arboretum opened. We opened the family garden, which was designed to be a children's garden, but it's really for families. And there's a lot of water there, a lot of things for kids to do. Uh, one of the the most popular places for children in our garden anywhere, and we have uh, an area like this in the arboretum, and we have one in the family garden, is what we finally refer to as the dirt dig. And it's a place for kids to go get dirty, dig, play, build things, uh, build forts, uh, build teepees, uh, just play in the dirt. And it's extremely popular. And, and, uh, so we're really happy about that. I think the big, one of the big changes is that pendulum swing that I talked about moving back towards science and conservation. I knew it would happen. I hoped that it would happen during my tenure here. Um, and it is happening. So we started off as a scientific endeavor. That was Mrs. J's vision. When we became a botanical garden, we moved away from that and by necessity because we really had to focus on gardening and not so much on, on science. Even though there is science gardening, I'm, I'm a horticulturist myself, but pure science. And we are doing pure science here now again. And then we had a conservation program for many years and Funding being what it is, that was one of the things that, that got caught up in tight budgets and we lost it. And now we have it back and we have a good funding source for it. And so I would say that that is a big change that we've had uh, here at the center. Will the new website in the pages on specific plants have links to BONAP, info to which animals use the species, etc.? 
Uh, Bonet, that's a good that's a good question. The, the honest answer is I hadn't considered Bonet, but I've been thinking about Bonet more lately. Uh, so we are closely aligned with the USDA plant database. They have a, uh, a way that they designate all the taxa on their database. It's called a USDA symbol. And that symbol is a key field in our database is how plants are identified in there. So we're closely aligned with them. The research that was done for BONAP was actually the seed research for the USDA plants database. However, USDA plants database has fallen behind on updating their data and their taxonomy. And BONAP is ahead of that. And so we're looking pretty hard at BONAP right now. Uh, hadn't considered putting it on the on the new website, but that is certainly a consideration. What I have considered is putting the Grin website up there because it's so useful for nativity. And if uh, I won't go into that, so so um, Bonap is really a useful thing. As far as which animals use the species, we already have some of that. There's actually a section that I didn't show you that has to do with uh, uses by um, animals, either positive or negative. There's a deer resistant field, for instance. Also, we have a, quite a bit of information about pollinators on our website, and we will have more in the future because it's such an important thing, both for, for the plants themselves and also people are very interested in pollinators. Uh, other uses by plants, uh, by all means, uh, we're always interested in putting information up there um, about the plant animal interaction is actually a very dear subject to me and one that I hope to work on in my retirement. Very good. Can the herbarium be accessed by the public? That's a good question. The answer is probably uh, the person who wanted to access the herbarium would need to contact Dr. Flickinger. And uh, he's a great guy. And I'll bet you he would be willing to let you come in and if you had never accessed an herbarium before, uh, he would give you uh, some a little bit of training on the proper way to handle herbarium specimens. Uh, they're very fragile. And if you have uh, herbarium experience, then he would uh, almost certainly be willing to let you, you know, do some do some research of your own. Also, you know, our herbarium is tiny. Uh, we have less than 5,000 specimens in our herbarium. We don't have much room. The University of Texas herbarium is one of the largest in the world, and I believe that is open to the public with an appointment. Wow. Okay, the next question has a lot of questions in it. Do you need more volunteers? To do what? How can people donate images? Do you need people to identify species? Or do you need photos only of blooming plants or question mark? What I'm going to put up is my contact information. I would recommend that anybody who, who's looking for information about these topics, some of these topics, um, to email me. Do I need more volunteers? I do, but my problem is I don't have a place to put them. I have some great volunteers right now. So the issue I have with volunteers is, is I, I'm just, I'm kind of a wash in volunteers. Uh, which is a wonderful problem to have because there was a time when I didn't have enough. Um, however, the Wildfire Center always accepts more volunteers. Um, being in Clear Lake, um, volunteering for us or for me uh, might uh, involve doing so remotely or doing so by, by computer. And that is a real possibility. Uh, if someone has an interest in that, um, then, then that might be something that we can do. Ah, uh, I see that the question is from Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, how can people donate images? Um, there is an instruction on our webpage on any, on any, um, image page on our website. There is a little tab at the top called, uh, contribute images and it, uh, gives instructions on how to do that. Truthfully, the better method is just to email me. And I will uh, send you information on on the requirements that we have. When we when we get images from people, it's not just pictures; it's pictures and data. So I have to have some data about where and when the photo was taken, what it was, et cetera. 
the one it was isn't nearly as important. Um, very often, if, if the photographer doesn't know exactly what the species was, uh, if they want to just send me the picture anyway or pictures, uh, I may very well be able to identify it after 23 years of doing this. I've gotten pretty good at identifying plants all over North America. Uh, and if I can't identify them to species, I can't publish them. So that's how it is. I do have a trim, just a huge backlog of images that as I, as I mentioned in my presentation right now. Um, I said we have nearly 83,000 and I have at least that many in the queue. Um, it's probably well over 100,000 waiting to be published. Um, I've had several extremely large projects that I've been working on. Uh, this um, um, website upgrade was the last of those projects. And I'm hoping to be able to get back to publishing images like I was for a couple of years, several years ago, and um, and work down that backlog. But um, we have a lot of images, but we always want good images. And for image donation, this always comes up. Well, what people typically say, Will, is um, I'll, I'll, um, I want to send you pictures that you don't have, of, of species that you don't have. And my answer is, if you have a great picture of the most common of a blue bonnet or an Indian paintbrush, if it's a great picture, I want it. I want image, interesting images of, of anything, not, not artistic, but just good pictures. And we, and we pride ourselves on having pictures of not only flowers, but whole plants of fruit, seed, uh, stems, thorn, uh, leaves. Root seeding, uh, you name it. If it's a plant part, I want pictures of it. Hairs, plant hairs for those who like to do macro photography. So all of those are important, very often extremely important in plant identification. One of, one of my happiest moments is, is, uh, a couple of times when I've heard from, of, um, from researchers who say, said, you know, you had the only picture that I could find anywhere of this plant part. That I was looking for and I needed to do what I was doing. That made me feel pretty good. Uh, do you need people to identify specific species? If somebody is really good at identifying things, I would love to talk to you. Uh, email me. Uh, let's let's chat about that. Uh, if if you love doing a plant identification, we used to have a, a formal plant identification service that a um, a retired geneticist named Nan Hampton, and she was also one of our Smarty Plant volunteers. Um, she and I uh, did these plant identifications, and it was a wonderful thing, and we loved doing it. And over about a year and a half, two-year period, it got to be wildly popular to the point that we were doing nothing but plant identifications, and that just wasn't going to work. So we had to stop doing that, but I, I frequently get Request from people to ID plants for them, and I'm always happy to do that. I I was very serious about customer service. I, I want to always give the best customer service that I can to anyone, and I and plant identification is one of those things. Since the database covers such a large area, it is difficult to know if a particular species is native to my locale. Mm -hmm. How would we know to address that? So there's a, there's a trick that I use. It's not foolproof, but it'll get you, it'll help you. Uh, the USDA plants database that I mentioned has an advanced search function where you can go in and you can enter your area. So the, the technique that I use is I'll go into that, into that advanced search and I'll select the, the county that I'm focused on. Then I'll also select all the adjacent counties because the the entries in that data, database and also in Bonat, by the way, are based on herbarium specimens. So it's data that's uh, collected from herbarium specimens all over the world. And that's where those county level data comes from. And so very often, if a specimen wasn't collected in your county, but it was collected next door, well, it wouldn't show up if you only did your county in your search. So I would recommend using that as a as a uh, search tool. It works great, and um, you may find that you'll you'll get a, a large number of, of species to look at. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. True, true, true. 
Do you know if there is a native grass for the lawn that can survive both summer and winter months in the Houston area? Well, I think by survive, you're talking about being green in the winter months uh, and summer months. And the answer, the, an the answer is I don't know of any such thing. You know, I, I gave a, a talk similar to this one a couple of days ago out in San Angelo, and I was talking to folks there before um, that, and they said that people were actually painting their grass green out there in the winter, which really made me sad. Uh, or they were doing it during the drought. Uh, and that makes me sad too. Uh, I hope that folks won't do that and just learn to live. Like our roadsides right now are a beautiful golden brown. <laughs> Not what you want to see, but it's actually pretty attractive. Um, just the color itself, it's really golden. Um, you know, so uh, brown lawns are not gorgeous. They're not as nice as green lawns. But uh, no, the answer is the answer is no. There isn't a native grass for lawns for the Houston area that will that will be uh, summer and winter grasses. The our native prairie grasses are uh, that are suitable for lawns are summer uh, summer grasses. So so that wouldn't work. What is bonap? Oh, bonap. Uh, bone app is uh, so. Let me scroll back up to that. Bone app is Biota of North America program. It's boneapp.org, um, and it's a it's uh, similar to what I mentioned earlier. The U.S. plant USDA plant database. Uh, they're very similar, uh, but they have different resources available there. And I'll leave it to you to uh, go and explore those two resources and find out more about them. By the way, since we're looking at resources here, the uh, Flora of North America uh, is a wonderful resource, very technical, uh, you know, very technical information about plants. But if you're really getting into plants and wanting to know more about that, um, uh, the Flora of North America project is, is really excellent. It's not exhaustive. It's not complete. It's a work in progress. I think they've got about maybe 75% of North America's plant species treated in there now, but it's a really good one. And uh, I recommend, actually recommend highly all of these um, uh, resources on the website here. Okay. Debbie, do you have any questions from the web? I do have a comment. And they said, it will be like Christmas when the new database is up and running. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it will be like Christmas for me, John, to tell you that. It's been a long, long journey getting here. I spent six months just writing the document for the changes that we needed to make. Um, so it's, it's, been a, it's been a road getting here. And our, our poor uh, web developers, they just, I don't think they had a clue about what they were getting into. But they're really great people. And I know that they're going to do a good job. Uh, I just don't know when it's going to go live, um, so we'll see. Okay, and I think one of the last unique questions is, what is your process to verify images? Oh, okay, uh, right. So there was a time when, early on, when we accepted images from photographers and we published them unverified. I no longer do that. Actually, for the last close to 15 years now, probably 12 years, I verify every image before I publish it. So the answer is, is we don't publish images that aren't verified. Do I make mistakes? I've made a couple. I'm proud to say that I haven't made many, but occasionally I'll get an email or a note from someone. Very often it's somebody with a native plant society somewhere, usually some other part of the country, who says, mm, you didn't quite get that one right. Sometimes it's a, a botanist. Uh, professor somewhere, but uh, I think my track record is pretty good at identifying plants. I'm, I'm very careful about that. And a lot of it has to do with how good the uh, photographer is at identifying things. Uh, very often it makes my job a lot easier if they know what they're talking about and know their plants. Well, Joe, I want to thank you for coming and sharing with us. As I said, I think most of us have either been to the Wild Flower Center or 
they're hoping to get there. So I think that covers all of us. So we are very grateful that you spent the evening with us. Thank you. Well, thank you. I um, uh, just want to uh, extend the invitation to everyone. Please come to the center when the weather is good. And uh, and when you come, come see me. I'd love to meet you.